Think Tank, State, Structure, and Future of Streaming. Presented by Sphere Radio, Work Collective and Hitness Club. So, willkommen zurück zur zweiten Runde. Ich hoffe, es hat euch allen gemundet. Vielen Dank an das japanische Haus für dieses leckere Essen. Wir machen weiter mit der gesellschaftlichen Dimension beim Think Tank State Structure and Future of Streaming. Und wir kriegen jetzt gleich zugeschaltet eine äh, Strategin und Consultant, äh, Georgia Tanetti, <lacht> die äh, für, da ist sie. Hello, Georgia. Ja, sehr gut, Strategin und Consultant. Ja, I just read this on the internet about you. <lacht> yeah, I've done like five years of German, so I still remember some words. <lacht> Yeah, so I introduce you in German and then I give over to you. Uh, Dankeschön. Georgia spricht heute für uns uh, im Rahmen von Artifati und Reset. Das ist ein neues Netzwerk für unabhängige Kultur- und Medienakteure in Europa. Sie hat einen starken Hintergrund in Musik, Events und Culture, war lange Zeit die Kommunikationschefin vom Sonar Festival in Barcelona, arbeitet auch für She Said, eine feministische Vernetzungsplattform und hat einen ganzen Reigen von Spezialitäten, von denen sie sicherlich gleich auch noch eine ganze Menge erzählt. Und heute, today you're telling us about this new uh, network reset, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So I, I, will, I will just get out of the picture and then it's, the stage is all yours. Fantastic and thank you very much. Danke schön to die Radio for hosting us in order to introduce reset. Um, it's not the first time, but almost the first time that we kind of have the choice, the, the possibility to introduce this new European cross-sectoral uh, network uh, that was created, uh, actually was organized and uh, thought of by Arti Farti in Lyon uh, and funded since November 2021 by Europe Creative and the European Networks of Culture and Creative Organizations program. Um, why organize, why organizing, why launching actually reset? Uh, the word itself is with an exclamation point at the end, which also, um, explains the active, uh, hyperactive and active attitude towards the fact of, uh, um, creating, growing and evolving, um, as a cultural network And not only cultural, we will explain later, but the cultural network that we spread um, will be organized by Lyon, from Lyon, but it will spread over 17 countries. And right now, 34 members that have already signed up to be part of this uh, association network. What is important uh, is, first of all, thank you to make this happen with Been the fantastic program that I've read of uh, this think tank. Um, the impact that the last two years have had in the cultural sector and specifically in the independent sector is valuable not only in quality and quantity, but also in the ultra dimension that has spread over the two years of lack of uh, work, funding, and also the The fact that the independent sector, the one that really relies on itself, so that the word independent is very clear who we're talking about, really had no net. And I think the nets that we need in the future, one of them is reset, uh, are built to make sure that we strengthen the position of independence in the cultural sector all over, in this case, Europe. Um, how to do it? It's, uh, it's the program and the layout of Reset that has been approved by Europe Creative and actually by all the members that have signed up is by working a three years program that actually starts now in 2022 and we lay out till 2025 January. In three years, the objectives of Reset is becoming, um, an organization, a network, but also an active organizer, which is different, of uh, situations of workshops, situations of discussions, situations in which we all find ourselves to exchange 
uh, the future of the independent sector. One of the things that came out of uh, <clears throat> one of the last uh, meetings we did with the team was the meaning of the independent word. And this, I think, is the the word that you also see already, and I guess the people that are attending today are more identified with. Uh, the independence in this case also creates or sometimes symbiotically uh, assumes that is a kind of uh, uh, um, loneliness or lack of support. So that lack of support is what we shall and we will or we must analyze through reset in order to be able to detect and check where are the, well, the strengths and where are the weakness of the cultural sector that is involved within the organization and beyond. There are right now several institutions in the world working in this kind of assessment and studios and studies, sorry, but um, the most important thing for us is not only to become expertly studying the situation from numbers and interviews, but it's also going into 17 countries to provoke workshops and discussions in a very offline physical way, which is much needed right now in terms of rediscovering uh, the borders that have been closed for so much, so many months and uh, actually go into the territories and analyze and discuss together in each territory what's not only the local needs but also the global needs that we can share or even support one with the other. I think personally as one of the representatives and spokesperson of Reset that we are in, in a moment in which festivals, media, creative hubs and municipalities needs to get together in order to know what's there. There are situations in which we will find probably that there are some members that have been weakened or that have actually enlarged or strengthened their objective in order to survive in a completely different world. And actually, I love the fact that this think tank is dedicated to the future of streaming, the very interesting discussions that we, I assume will, will lead to the discussion on the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 and metaverse. And it's true that also this digital commitment towards uh, maintaining and um, accepting the values of sustainability in the physical and digital world uh, are the values that also sustain reset. Um, in between these 40, 34 uh, members, in between there is free radio, there are festivals, that are committed, of course, to the value that we share, that are basically inclusion, digital democracy, uh, eco-responsibility, but also a broader way to uh, think about culture and the spread of culture uh, that is not centralized. This, I think, is one of the key points of the independent sector thoughts, and it's also the key points of Reset as an organization that needs to be structured in a way in which each member supports the other in a very organic way, but also uh, there is this need of uh, communitarian means and objectives in order to be stronger towards the advocacy, uh, towards municipalities, and not only municipalities, but also the European uh, institutions. Uh, so there is a one, two, three layers objectives in this case, one is clearly to identify and enlarge the networks uh, of the independent in, in, uh, in Europe. The more variety, the better, um, and also the more discussion, the better. As we know, independence, independence means also the independence of opinion and the way to sustain the opinions and kind of merge them together in an harmonic way. This will be one of the tasks. Uh, the second part of the members will be, of course, uh, emerging high potential media, independent media. We will never say independent enough, um, which can definitely or are, are already uh, interacting and in an active way changing the uh, media ecosystem. Um, then we will have creative venues and hubs. I definitely think that creative venues and hubs uh, offline and physically are much needed now in order to 
rebuild and strengthen the physical bonds that we can have to each other. Even if we're talking here in the, in the um, future of streaming, I think it's very important to, to think that we will still live very much in a physical world and that physical world will need to feel the contact, the human contact again and the uh, possibility to um, uh, emotionally bound and bind people together again. So I think that these credit venues and hubs uh, uh, will definitely be the, the next, uh, maybe the workshop hubs, but definitely the places where things will be discussed in a more offline way. And municipalities, we already have Lyon and Brussels um, supporting the project, knowing about the project and being involved in the discussions. Of course, uh, being the project led by Aki Sapti, um, there will be uh, you know, very, very strong partners in the France uh, sphere. But uh, from now, we'll be actively uh, searching and enlarging the scope of it and also the influence of it in order to uh, be able to develop in three years' time, very strong, uh, not only cultural, but also engagingly political ecosystem towards culture. Uh, one of the things that I think it's more important also is to think that culture has had, in, in my experience personally, uh, through the years, being involved as I was with a big organization, middle organization, and working also with uh, female-focused uh, women in music uh, uh, networks, uh, I can tell that culture is sometimes a word that seems big in, 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 in definition, but must be, uh, of course, strategically used in different matters. We need to cover all the cultural sector the better we can, and the communion, the communion discussion that we have here is to be engaging which each one of them and consolidating the third sector as the a sector that is actually economically viable, um, very strong in uh, communion and very strong also ethically. And this is why I think that the first 60 members uh, in the 2022 workshops that we will organize will be about uh, values that are about responsibility, youth and transmission, cooperation, tools and capacities, resource and financing, mediation and financing, mediation and advocacy. It's a very, very ambitious program, but it really stands out of where Reset was born. If I rewind a bit, Reset came also out of uh, the call of the independent sector that was raised in France by Artifacti and had at the end of 2020, of 2020, uh, yes, 2020, the COVID year, as we say, um, was already supported by more than 130 uh, entities. This call for independence had such a thrive and was signed and uh, discussed by so many entities that actually became reset outside the borders of France. And I think that we all can agree, and, and then I'm hopefully uh, waiting for your questions and your debate at the end of this explanation. Uh, we all can agree that there are, uh, there are so many things to be discussed after this recovering uh, period that we are already experiencing in some countries, in some others maybe not and how this recovering period can't really be the same as before and need to be um, restructured and uh, re, uh, re-inhabited for each one of you, from, to, from all of us, in a different way, with all these uh, uh, stronger values that have been even more highlighted after the COVID, uh, well, especially during the COVID times. Uh, these workshops are actually the core of the program, this 17 workshop will actually lead to um, every time we come back home, we will analyze what's the best coming from those networks, from those workshops, from those meetings physically, what comes out uh, from there will then generate short manifestos that can be applied either by the local, either by the global networking and shared in between all the members. And another task that is commanded by uh, the structure is to create a white paper that will 
actually compiled the views of what is created during those workshops, including political and structural proposals that we can use in the future to become proposal that goes straight to the European community. So it's actually not only active in the sense that I told you before for the question mark, but it's also uh, quite effective in terms of objectives. We will go straight to the European community. We are funded by them in order to create uh, uh, an, um, an, analytic, an analytic study that can actually help quality and quantity to analyze the status of the independent sector, the third sector. Uh, another thing that will be sponsored and promoted by Reset will be a study by L'Observatoire des Politiques Culturelles de Grenoble, which I translate is the Observatory of Cultural Politics by Grenoble, uh, which will be uh, proposing a redefinition and a reposition of the industry in Europe. As we probably you will discuss during those days, um, this is basically the need for all of us to use those data that we will access through the network in order to be able to analyze in a much more accurate way what is going on in the countries that we are actually participating with and working with. And with these data, we'll be much more capable to analyze and filter this in order to offer a realistic study to the cultural uh, institutions in Brussels uh, and uh, also a much more accurate evaluation of the strategies to be imploded or implemented uh, by them and in order to help or sustain the sector. Uh, there will be an, another active sphere of reset which will go down to what I call the mentoring side, masterclass, collective online training, peer-to-peer -peer networking activities. It's all about sharing. So when we become the organizers of this kind of exchanges, we will also, of course, rely on the digital platforms. And we will also rely on the way we will propose to our members to be part of these um, masterclasses which will also be hosted by external experts speakers uh, people that can actually help giving an objective way or actually an, a third eye to what we already will be discussing by ourselves within our members the aim is not to be a closed organization is to be the, the most open organization but we'll need some kind of evaluation of the members in terms of what again is to be independent and to be aligned with the values that I already quoted, but I also think are very important that we all share. Um, of course, there will be a conference and debate, but this will be for the kickoff. Uh, kickoff is already planned in Brussels. Uh, we have a date for that, and uh, we will have a conference happening. We will. It's not the same as a workshop, as you know. Uh, workshops will be led and organized locally by each member in order to really strategize um, strategize the, the the work that we need to do during the year. Uh, the conference and kickoff will be more, of course, the way to invite people that are actually working probably in the same directions. Maybe they are not in Europe and maybe they are in Europe, but they are in different organization and to be able to exchange with them uh, also new way of working or attacking uh, these matters and issues and also to maximize the experience of all members uh, because reset is also about you know giving a platform that gives a quality of discussion that can enhance uh, the final results after three years which will be which will lead to the part that is more political uh one of the key things at the end of reset will definitely create pilot actions with local authorities and institutions i would i would think and i will imagine that this will happen at the end of every year where we get to know and we get to get closer to them unless the members are already close to them and get to mobilize these institutions and local authorities in order to be able either to change policies either to um, redistribute 
the financial supports that every country will have at their disposal for the uh, reconstruction and rebuild of the cultural sector in the next three years. Um, one of the last values of Reset that I think it's also very valuable for all of us is the advocacy action. Um, it comes within the, uh, the, the, really the empathy and the, the, the sentiment of Artifati is really embedded of the Artifati community philosophy. And this advocacy action towards policymakers, locally, nationally, internationally, it's basic in order to really create a strong identity as reset within the institutional uh, system. And this is why uh, the first kickoff will be in Brussels. I think it's very uh, symbolic. It's very important because we already give a stress that we are there where the decision making for the European community is taken. And I think also make sure that we are close to decision making at the same time we have an open door there to discuss and present reset and present the updates that we might have every single time we have the possibility to develop one of the workshops I mentioned. And also every time online, we have the possibility to offer uh, the, the, the building up the master classes, uh, the speakers, uh, the peer to peer conversations and network and building up. So I think, I think it's about in a way, uh, find out who is there and find out what are they doing, each one of us, in order to reset the cultural scenarios in the next three years. Uh, I do think the next three years are key to understand not only the cultural scenarios physically again, after almost two years without being able to be physically in a proper way, and also in the 2.0, don't resetting our presence online, and we are setting our presence around the media online, which is also, a, as we probably, you would probably discuss, it's also a, a scenario which is very fluctuating and changing. And then eventually even thinking about, of course, the situation about the 3.0 and metaversic um, jump. Uh, I think we all, and that's more also a personal thought, but of course, I, I guess, and I hope you share it with me, we all need to be prepared we all need to kind of strengthen our our basis and we all need we all might need i mean it's not a need but it's a it's a wish we all wish that we could uh, again um, in a way discover there's no borders for reset and we actually uh, making the exchange of these uh, policies discussions formulas numbers um something that really builds up some, uh, a project and a platform that will definitely be a net, uh, anything comes. So uh, I welcome, I welcome, of course, you to uh, meet Reset and uh, I hope you have, you have understand what our aim is. As I said before, to steer Radiant to everyone interested, we'll have a proper presentation that will be ready for you in the next days. Um, with the key moments and key steps that we are taking uh, from now till 2025. Um, I will leave now if, if you want or if you wish uh, some time for a question and answers. I don't know if you have any or if you want me to go more specific about reset, um, any kind of uh, digital question or offline question that you, ha you have uh, in place there. Thank you, Georgia, for so far. <laughs> Your applause. Thank you. I can imagine that there are quite a few questions in the audience, so I'm just asking. Of course. You, uh, first of all, did you all understand what this was about? <laughs> and are you, do you have any uh, question of understanding, like, towards a certain aspects before we get into a discussion? So is there anything that we need to clarify? Aha, uh -huh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, maybe we need a moment to let it sink in, if that's okay with you. Well, 
always that's why i actually sorry to say but normally i finish a bit earlier than what i thought it was because i know that i hook in a lot of information uh and it's good for having like a lot a minute of a set name as usual in order to everything will come in a way i mean questions will come and you know there's many main lines that have been you know sorted out with reset so i just let you think about it and uh, of course i'm here to take any question or any debate together mm -hmm. much better well i have a question right away um because you sent me a little paper beforehand so <laughs> yes i did good also read along um you said there are workshops going to be in 16 uh, i think in your speech you said 17 member countries could you list some that might be close to us uh, I mean, yes, uh, the thing is that we are still uh, preparing. I mean, as we speak, as usual, as networks that are very open, uh, the numbers will raise and will change. Normally, the uh, logistic, I think, scenario will be 16. Uh, and uh, we will reveal the 16 countries very soon, as soon as we are closing one to the other. Um, we have, uh, of course, Germany, we have France, Italy, Hungary, Romania. Uh, there are right now, I did the list to confirm the list that I had, the latest one, I had 17 countries, but it doesn't mean that we will reach every single one of them, even if, because I actually think there will be more countries uh, um, jumping in than uh, the actual uh, workshops that we can do uh, per year. But uh, of course, there will be a thought and selection because of the capacity of each country to organize and also the neighboring, uh, the neighboring countries that can uh, go together uh, in the workshops physically. But I think it will be, uh, it's, it's, it's a must. It's, that's why I put that as a, as a first step uh, offline because uh, every, I mean, and I wish I would be there with you to tell you the truth because I, I definitely think it's a, it's a fantastic moment for uh, reuniting physically um, in the places and actually feel what is going on, not only within the country, but also within the cities, because, you know, uh, we were we were thinking about, we always think about countries, but I definitely think that uh, cities sometimes mark a lot, especially in, for instance, in a country like yours, Germany, city, uh, it's a city, depending on where the city is, uh, what the cultural institution is, it changes the way you fluctuate in between the relationship with the institutions, the relation with the municipality of the region. So I think it's also interesting to kind of analyze how many cities we will be able to um, cover because uh, the needs of each city uh, will definitely also highlight uh, not only the national needs of independence, but also the local needs of independence. And sometimes city become um, like the perfect ecosystem for testing new ways for testing new conversation and discussions, for being maybe more daring than going directly to the national scale. So I think actually they're very good labs to work with uh, because they, as, as much as Artifati, I think they work very closely to the city in Lyon is because with this, with this action, we actually can use the city beyond borders to kind of being connected to each other uh, first and then come into a national discussion. Yeah, I think you just hit a spot there because especially in Germany, we already discussed yes. this in the first round that um, due to our federal uh, politics, that yes. every um, federal state has different approaches towards uh, cultural institutions and uh, support of media, for instance. There's a, we already have like a microcosmos within the mi macrocosmos of Europe. So that'll be interesting. So um, just very directly ask, is there any... Um, Leipzig player that you're uh, that you're approached or that that is involved in your well, network. Sphere Radio is yes, okay. <laughs> Sphere Radio is member, and that's uh, why I also thank Sphere Radio because uh, they're members and they're also part of the conversation. I think that um, you know uh, when I work at Sonar, I actually work uh, within this uh, territory regional in uh, in germany that's why i'm familiar with it we work with hamburg and we work within the schleswig holstein situation we work with uh, cologne uh so i knew i know by by first hand as you said that uh, the german situation can be actually very interesting to discuss within different territories in different regions 
in order to know so no because you know as as uh and that also helps and we've been discussing with the team uh it also happens in spain and it also happens uh you know within catalonia for instance barcelona or madrid uh, there are different uh, strategies in terms of cultural sectors uh, within the the power, the political power. So yeah, I mean it's a it's a common goal that we also kind of uh, upload the thought of countries versus cities, cities versus also individual uh, organizations that might have you know different scenarios in place. Thank you. Um, one of qu one question that I have is like, who's going to lead the workshop? So it will be implied, or is it a sort of train the trainer situation? And do you provide um, a structure for for people um, to be fit in certain subjects and um, carry it on to their um, specific communities? The the workshop it will lead. I mean, we will kind of lead a structure and a budget, of course. So that's important on a, on a practical basis. But it's true that we will have um, SS Lyon and Artifati, Doan based in Barcelona, but that will be uh, physically in both countries uh, as much as I can. Uh, but it's true that we will have a, a, a kind of project leader. We have a project leader already, but we will have some kind of different situations with the workshop organization. Uh, the local scenario is very important for the workshop organization because it's it is when the person that can host or the organization that can host is actually the organization that know, knows best about the local needs and the local uh, discussions that can be evolving in the scenarios in each country. So yes, it's it's definitely a a, a kind of a logistic from Lyon but uh, definitely uh, very engaging discussion and conversation with the organizer locally yeah yeah so i saw a question in our audience um of Bas course yeah basti you wanted to say something so i guess my my question was directed uh in a similar direction so um you you talked about supporting the independent sector of like you know streaming and multimedia and all that and i just felt like it was as you said, a very ambitious thing to support something which by definition is so decentralized. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, but I guess uh, the previous question was regarding that as well. Um, but yeah, no, like, I, like I, on, I, on like a microscopic um, scale, you know, like I, I'm just wondering how you could scale the idea of, you know, supporting independent people that, that kind of do arts in their own way, produce cultures and uh, culture in their own way. Like, how could you collect and address all of their needs and even have that span across different countries? It's a very good question. Uh, your name is Basti. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Basti. Um, actually, I think the white paper uh, and the study it's the one that we rely on to kind of put everything in common. I mean, um, I totally agree that uh, in, in the independent sector, the independent sector is because of its name is based on the multiplication of individuals and it's not based on multiplication of structures. So, you know, uh, that's why it's called independent. I think it's the independent sector based on, uh, it can be, a sum up of individuals, but the needs of each one of the independent artists or independent media platforms are, it can be as, as small as one, as big as, you know, a hundred. Definitely when we're talking independent, we're not talking a hundred thousand, unfortunately. So the, the good thing about getting together is getting to that number of multiplying individuals and multiplying micro uh, micro situations into a bigger uh, panorama. That means, of course, there will be a need to kind of ambitiously negotiate with your needs toward the needs of the collective. That's also a base of the independent sector. But at the same time, there are great ideas that are coming from, you know, individual or microscopic situations that because of the system that we talk about in the CD things, are the best ways to kind of be very fast forwarding, very future oriented, because they don't 
need to justify themselves towards, you know, I don't know, a hundred employees. Uh, if so I could just when you are, yeah, sorry. Um, so I, I guess if we um, kind of switch around this relationship that you just described, I, I'm just afraid that um, the project you're describing becomes this abstract thing for independent artists. And the question really is, how will it help smaller organizations like Sphere Radio, for instance, to, to also benefit from the information that does seem incredibly useful for what you're describing, you know, collecting a diversity of ideas, merging that into something bigger. But how, how would you describe that from the other, other direction? Like take any small scale player who's not actively involved with that project yet, like what are their entry points? What's the, what's the kind of value you, you can provide to them, um, you know, when they want to step into it? Well, the interesting thing is that each member is definitely, will definitely provide an influence in their own sphere. Uh, you call sphere radio, but I wanted to use sphere because it really applies here. Uh, meaning that this, um, the good thing about a network, and it's not a project, it's a network already. So first of all, we are a network, we're not a project. It was a project in November, it become an, a network. So we are a network, we have 34 members growing in, and we have 17 countries, which I counted today. That's clear. The good thing is we have any level of, of uh, big, smaller, institutional, non-institutional, et cetera. The same thing is what it makes it together is the ethos and the capacity and also the active will to actively participating in the discussion and actively offering data, information, spreading information. It's, it's, this is what a network is about. The, the, to answer your question, how this becomes real, which I think is the question, is uh, how this becomes real, first of all, in the workshops, of course, because this workshop will be open to discussion in the local scene and in, within the local range, which means the independent sector of the place will be invited to participate, will be invited to share. At the same time, there will be a platform that will share data, results, uh, connections. So, you know, I come from a very big uh, PR background and, you know, this is what actually saved me every day. It's like to have all these people that I know in the, in the cultural sphere makes my strength, makes the fact that I can reach out when I have, uh, you know, for instance, I think that the presence of reset in that discussion that you're doing, which I wish I had time to all watch it all because I I'm a big you know I've been involved with the streaming scenario of the festival and I know a lot about streaming and audio so I love that but it's true that it's like just the fact that I'm talking to you is offering me a second thought and is offering me some richness the the fact that you're questioning me and telling me what how you feel about it is already giving me an insight that is really useful about how to grow the network the right way and how to answer you these questions the right way. One of the exercises that we'll be doing editorially, for instance, is to answer the FAQ of Reset, which is like, which will be the frequent uh, questions that we will have and how to answer them in a very practical, direct way to make people understand what it is, how to be engaged, and uh, what will be the result in the future. I think these are the three questions that we're definitely aiming to answer the most practical and clear and transparent way possible. I don't know if this answers your question. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, next frage, the next question is from Simon. Uh, I'm actually not having a question. It's more that I can give an example how it can work. Because as Georgia already mentioned, we became part of um, the Reset Network. Uh, that happened um, by getting asked uh, from one of the members or one of the organizers of uh, Reset because he heard of us uh, due to a festival that is happening here. And um, I was invited as a first step to the first Reset workshop, which happened in Budapest uh, a few weeks ago. And 
um, I, from my side, can say that it, it, this changed immediately the whole possibility frame of what we are actually aiming and trying to do since quite a while, because our capacity, our, lim our budget, and also uh, due to that, all the possibilities we have are really limited. We are a very small organization. We don't get paid for most of our work. And uh, by joining this network, uh, there, there is a, immediately a new addresser for our ideas. Yes. So we, we were able to, or we are now able to really maybe realize um, ideas and, and concepts that we are working on since the very beginning, like creating a, an alternative uh, digital social network, for example, create, because that is part of the, of the reset uh, concept long-term wise. And also uh, that part of this workshop here is to create like a, a, a wiki for cultural actors where co um, solutions and difficulties are collected and open source wise uh, accessible to people. But for us, it, it would be so difficult to realize that in a time that is necessary and uh, needed because if it would take really long that we would really realize it. But from the moment on, I was able to speak to people uh, having this big uh, EU funding, it changes because they have a budget, we have a budget, so a small budget, but we can apply also for additional fundings more easily. If we have the, the support from such a big organization that has a EU funding, gives trust to other funding um, stations, and also um, we actually have a very similar idea that is almost matching perfectly, so we, we actually enlarge the, the frame of, of, uh, yeah, of uh, help that Reset can give and also help others to insp or inspire others to also join and say, hey, we have this idea in our, uh, in our basement since so long, but we were not brave enough to realize it because we don't have the strength. But this organization is really big. It exists since 20 years. They have a big festival that is helping also to finance their work, they have people employed. So there's a total different situation from this moment on. You have people w being able to work constantly on things. And they, they are really and, open and listen and yeah. And also think, and thank you very much, because that's, uh, you know, it's like having a live statement from, from one of the members, which is a fantastic endorsement, by the way. But at the same time, I think that you also need to consider that fragmentation is really, really bad for independent uh, culture in Europe. So the less fragmented you are, the better you, which doesn't mean concentration. We all don't want to hear that word, uh, but it's definitely fragmentation doesn't help. So it's a bit to put pieces together locally and sum up. It's a win-win situation in which everybody needs to kind of feel, uh, um, uh, feel supported, but at the same time, uh, if somebody doesn't support the other, it doesn't work. So the good thing that you actually uh, said, and I think it's it's super priority, is that the fact that every one of the members is engaged as much as you know the 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 organization in Lyon, because this is how it should be. The fact that everyone um, gives their thoughts, and not only their thoughts, their data, the contacts. It's all about uh, knowing how many people are really uh, engaging in the same way with the same values and where do you want to reach? And, you know, uh, I don't want to be kind of simple minded here, but it's true that, you know, uh, the quantity does mean something, you know, the fact that we are uh, more and together makes a point towards any form of action politically or engaging the, uh, towards the institution. So uh, I think it's very important. But it's also important for us as our party to accept and be able to analyze carefully and nicely, as uh, we know, uh, the, the situation for each country and for each uh, city. Because as I said, we have a lot to learn from each other. And as much as we get to learn and absorb uh, the work that we can do together, it will definitely open doors for a stronger situation for the independent sector in three years time. Hopefully that's our objective. Thank you, Georgia. So far, uh, we're going to take a little break. I'm not quite sure if you'll be back with us or yes. So we'll see you uh, in another 
15 minutes and we just Fantastic. kind of have a little bit of air outside. <laughs> the sun Much is shining better. today. <laughs> I set the concepts and I see you in 15 minutes time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had some questions to you and um, yeah, maybe we should go into the discussion uh, as we have a variety of um, local activists and, and networkers. The question maybe into the audience that might, that we could discuss with Georgia is um, we, in the in the first round we discussed existing uh, cultural networks. Uh, yeah, we also um, discussed on certain topics that um, occur to you. So in resonance uh, with George's um, speech. Is there anything that comes to your mind that um, you you want to express or, or that you want to discuss from your own practice? Nasty, what is the meldung? I guess I have to address someone in person and pick someone to tell. No, actually, it's it's normal. I think that it will be good for me, if possible, uh, in between the physical people that you're there, uh, if anyone could could actually uh, tell me what their expertise are. They all do. Do they all think they represent the independent cultural sector? And if so, why? I, I, that's uh, it's one very interesting question to me. The fact that you, how do you identify as the independent, independent within the cultural sector? What's the feeling about this word, if possible? If I can ask things instead of them asking me. Of course, you can ask questions. It's a think tank. It's not a panel discussion. Yeah, that's why I think it's important for me to know. <laughs> Sabine, möchte ich in the front. <laughs> Oops. I can uh, answer your question, um, but I have a question as well. And uh, the answer on your question is that I'm representing the independent radios uh, of Germany. So I'm a member of the board of the Bundesverband Freie Radios. And my question to you is, do you think um, some people who uh, are engaged in social, um, how you can, in, in a culture of uh, Roma people and do some education for Roma children, children is, is, are people like that um, uh, becoming to be a member of Reset? Well, uh, first this, of all, is, is uh, if I can use one thing, the fact that you you are representing the independent radio, but you use the word fire, which I guess is very much linked to, I can't see you, though. Right now I can't see you, or maybe it's the way it is structured, my... Can, I know you can see me, but I can't see... Uh, now I can see you. So... Um, <laughs> Two things, when you say higher, I guess uh, it's a very good question to kind of put freedom and independence in the same platform, meaning free from what? This is a very good question uh, that I will ask myself, not to you, because it's a big question, but it's true that when you want to redefine the independency, you need to, I will need to think, and we all, I think we all need to think, what are we independent from? Which is a, a it's a very good thing that you made me you made me ask that that it can be part of the investigation that we're doing about this definition of independence. Exactly for the same thing I will answer you the fact that uh, uh, Roma it's it's a I mean what I think of of independent cultural sector they're basically intersectional. So by being intersectional meaning that they open their doors to any. Uh, and not only they open the doors, but they are not closed at all to any difference in genre, sex, 
a race, a racial or social economical situation, which means it amplifies the network for everybody that is included. And why that? Because inclusion is one of the key of reset. So actually the Roma uh, situation, it's very interesting because we will have possibly and surely um, some organizations linked to the Spanish Roma, uh, which will mean that will be, of course, because they culturally so relevant, they will have uh, a voice and they will actually need to have a voice in this kind of platform. Because I, um, that's why I would like to kind of specify that inclusion for me and for the networks I represent among them, reject, uh, it's linked profoundly to inter intersectionality. And within that intersection, there is everyone and that is normally, you know, consider minority as excluded to the main uh, to the main discussion. So this word is for me the key word to understand the future of platforms and include, as I said before, for those who don't know intersectionality, it includes anybody with no difference in uh, such sexual, uh, sexual, social, socioeconomic situation or racial situation, which for me is the next through a spirit of inclusion that we can have. Okay, thank you. Do you want an answer for people being independent of what? Yeah, <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to hear from you. Why do you think independence and, and freedom, which are totally the same, but we don't say we are free, we say we are independent. Yeah, but okay, I would so. like to ask you what you consider your independent from. Uh, it's a it's a historical world because it's founded in the 90s and I'm not sure if people would uh, take the same name today uh, and in the 90s it was of course free from commercials and uh, free from business and today you can say we try to be free from algorithms interesting yeah that I could, at some times, you know, I'm a, um, I teach digital ecosystems at school and um, I would clarify that my position on that would be uh, free from algorithms that are not my own. Meaning that you can also own the fact that you kind of uh, program algorithms in your own uh, use. So, you know, I don't understand algorithms by themselves without the people that are actually programming them behind them. So, in my terminology of digital, how I specify digital algorithm to my students, I, I always try to harmonize this because uh, we might need to use algorithm for the future um, quantification of data, even for the independency sector. But for me, uh, the free from the algorithms that are actually programmed by the people I want to be free from, yes. Free from algorithm in general, no, because I think it's just, it's just a way to program data and, uh, and to actually help me program data in a quick way and also offer a situation in which we can deliver different algorithms. As much as we can create independent metaverseic, uh, you know, ecosystem. But I think that also algorithms can be, as much as they are slaved by people, they can be slaved by the independents and make them work for the good cause. <clears throat> I mean, they're not alive, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The second uh, aspect is uh, that they, in the 90s, it was free from uh, the bureaucracy or free from the yeah. s from state regulations. Mm. So um, we are we're independent in a kind of way that uh, they, I explained it before in the morning, there was another model of uh, open channels. Uh, community media were like um, uh, directed from the authorities and uh, we are independent from that, so we are not in, uh, directed from the authorities. It's from bottom, bottom up and not from top down. Yeah. So it's in the history of, of German uh, community media, it's also 
big difference between citizen radios as it calls by state institutions and the so-called free radios. And this is throughout the whole German speaking area that there's this distinction made. But actually, um, it also leads to us um, wanting to establish uh, the free or community media inside the third column or the third sector, which uh, is still not acknowledged completely in Germany. And I remember that you also um, mentioned the third sector in your paper. So that would be something like some ac advocacy that we need, you know, to, okay. to push this because at the moment the um, independent or free and community media are treated the same way as private institutions. And then we have a second uh, sector and this is uh, the sector of uh, public and, and state run stations. So these two are like the entities and, and we are just uh, number 2B instead of number 3. You're the pink elephant in the game. So. Totally. I also think that, you know, as much as you identify with the German situation, I I am close to some independent radios in Milano and Italy and also some independent radios in, in England. And uh, I think that the free radio stations uh, have had in the past uh, Especially, for instance, the Italians, uh, the Italians are actually struggle to be determined as free radio stations because that it's very strange or very, uh, it's a bit of an anomaly the way they operate. But I think it's interesting the way you say it. At the same time, I think that um, when you say, uh, and I was going back to your discussion about you know the, the economical power, but I I kind of is tired right now. Actually, I'm quite inspired of the DAO situation, the decentralization of organization. So I think that we all kind of think that we are working in, uh, or we'll be working towards uh, platforms that are actually decentralized. And uh, this is actually being reproduced in the sometimes very wrong or very good in the metaverse situation and the crypto world. And I think um, it can be easy to jump to the conclusion that uh, you know, the metaverse will be better than the actual world in terms of organizations. And that's why I think one of the aims that I would love to work towards in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the platform is also how to learn from the things that are actually opening up in the Web 3.0 and, you know, all these new situations that are opening up in order to uh, understand how they organize decentralized uh, communities. Because I think it will be very interesting to see how that beginning of a third dimension of the web will give us, or will give us all, opportunities of working towards a much better digital space. But that's a, a utopian thought, in a way. Yeah, that's why I uh, liked you introducing that you worked on why there is no support because I think that is the, uh, the question of uh, free radio mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, that this uh, third sector, which uh, Nikki mentioned, is never really established. So there is no support in, uh, in this kind of question. Totally. And I agree that, um, I mean, unfortunately, I would love to say that is that true, but unfortunately, the only way to go is to do it yourself and uh, and uh, you know uh, there's no other way to go so uh, i think it's fantastic that we kind of you know we are we are putting together it's not that we are trying it's definitely we are putting together a platform that needs to be um a, a really a trampoline for getting uh, recognized which you know the recognition needs to be also decided to who we want to be recognized from. And this is a very interesting discussion that we can have. Do you want to be recognized you know, by the German national institution? Do you want to be recognized by the European sector? Do you want to be recognized where and, where and who? It's probably the most interesting thing that to be analyzed in, in the first steps of the network, you know, because priorities are different for everyone. So, 
Yeah. In Germany, it's really clear where we want to be recognized in the law. Yeah. <laughs> of course, within the legal. No, 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 no. Yeah, there's, but there's then, yeah. another, there's an, a further, there's a further reason because all of the universe is going around money and uh, the the money from the um, uh, Rundfunkmittel, it's, I don't know, there's the public money for the... It's the public uh, Yeah, it's not the public money, it's the time to TV it, license. It, yeah, so the, the, yeah. the taxes that we pay for yeah, uh, every yeah. household. We use it everywhere. Yeah, no, yeah. no, it's really, you don't speak about public money because this is really divided in Germany because of the experience of the Nazis. They divided it and they say the media is... Uh, um, independent from the public money so uh, we we uh, aiming to the to the tv or rundfunk uh, mittel and uh, the the aim would be in the end that we are going to um, there is a um, how you say it, a institution and this institution controls or this institution um, There's a money collecting in some mines uh, where the money goes to, and uh, we want to go to this institution and tell them what budget we want to have, and then of get course. the budget. Yeah. Of course. So, but you know, it's interesting because you know there is the EBU, there is the room full, and then they have all these structures that kind of even fund each other uh, in the radio spectrum, and I think that. Uh, one of the things that actually didn't help uh, the EBU and the Rundfunk and many of them also in Italy and Rai and all the, you know, even if yours, it's economically organized differently. I think that the reality of independent radios, it's that they all, I mean, for me, when you talk to you, to talk like this, uh, and if you talk to a, an Italian person or, uh, you know, or an English person, you probably have the same some kind of same issues. Maybe not that specifically, but you know, getting institutional money, whatever they come from, uh, to sustain um, a system based on free organization is something that go against their will. You know, it's like um, you can't have control on them. We don't know what's the programming. They are too free. Uh, etc. 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 So you know, in, in I think I come from the techno universe. So independent is in my heart. We we work only with independent radios because the national radios never wanted to play techno at the time. I mean, German is different, but in in Italy definitely it was very independent. And you know, it, it's a it's a world where I was born and bred. So I definitely think that uh, you need to also accept the cultural value and the cultural impact that these organizations have toward the people in order to justify the fact that you are valuable. Not only that you are decentralized, but you're also changing the culture around you. And this is something that it needs to be shown, you know, in a way to um, to justify, as usual, because we it's all about justifying, but it's justify the work and the impact you have, not only quantity wise, but also the fact that you are working towards. And I, I found free radio as we speak probably the most interesting radio always because they go straight to the to the needs of the people not the needs of the corporation yeah i think in some kind of way we are uh, um, uh, uh, successful because uh, the eu uh, does us recognized as a uh, own sector so but that doesn't help because the the countries does not what the eu uh, tells them what would be good for the country. So it's yeah, still I mean, on work. Yeah, it's a, it's a long time already that it was implied. And uh, we have our own landing page. Yeah, on, from, uh, from the EU Council, but yeah. it's, it's not ratified by Germany, for instance. And since we have this federal structure, um, still every radio is battling their own battle. I mean, in support. And we talked about this before your talk. Uh, Within our associations, we help each other out and also on a European and world level. But still, you know, as long as this acknowledgement process is not happening and uh, the decision of the EU is not implied in the German system, it will, ha it will stay like it is. And the problem is that many um, radios, for instance, cannot even uh, apply for certain fundings because yeah. they're not applicable. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I think this is a fantastic point of discussion to start with in terms of, you know, this is exactly what the kind of discussions in a workshop you will have, you know, this is exactly what, well, right now, not now, because I know this, I hope this, will this be recorded? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we will have it recorded and in a way we we know that we have this uh, analysis that we share together and it's actually putting already a point that is very interesting to absorb and share also with the other countries in order to know where we are at with that situation. But uh, since we're both the moderators for this whole week, I think we should also open the floor for others to advocate, uh, advocate their own or agents, their, their, their own uh, networks and, and um, collectives. Um, is there any kind of demand for getting closer in touch or any questions on how to get involved with Reset, for instance, from, from you guys here? I have an idea. <laughs> You're already a member. <laughs> yeah, and it's not about me. Um, wait, I tried to get rid of that. So um, my idea is because there is also another um, aspect of independency, which is um, independency of knowledge, which you only get through um, certain degrees or educations that you are uh, able to, to have. And a lot of people within the cultural sector don't have these educations or these uh, the, the possibilities to to get a certain knowledge and um, yeah I, I think what would be very interesting is to hear from the people here in the room what um, knowledge or what skills what things they are lacking and therefore struggling in in finding solutions for their own work and own projects was that clear to everyone I can also say it in German if necessary uh, yeah, maybe someone has wants to say something about that. Would also help very much to understand how a wiki could look like and uh, what what needs what it needs and how it has to be structured. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. For instance, I I have a suggestion because one thing that I know what I'm what the projects I've been in are always struggling with is bookkeeping finances, you know, even if you finally managed to write a successful application, once you got the money, usually you forgot to put someone in who's professionally doing bookkeeping. So maybe we, this is a starting point for some of you, like how, what is your experience? Have you ever received public funding and, and how do you work with that money? And do we, do you come across any kind of struggles? Um, yeah, I, I guess my uh, response uh, would be directed towards Simon. I know that there are now a couple topics uh, up in the room for grabs, but regarding the wiki, I think it's important to realize that, especially with media, there are so many, uh, so many interdisciplinary needs that even if we're discussing one topic specifically, uh, the amount of depth you have to like pay to certain skills that you're talking about depends on the vantage point you have, I guess. So uh, um, I already said that I'm uh, representing the Uni of Weimar and I'm a, a VR application developer there. I focus a lot of my time on, you know, developing interactive systems. How can people socially interact in VR? But uh, what we're lacking a lot of times is the expertise for like, how do these, mo um, how do these environments look from an artistic sp standpoint, for instance? So, uh, you know, if I were to, to explain what I do on a daily basis, it would be very important for me to receive back feedback from from people out of the arts community to, you know, that that actually brought me here to this think tank to like exchange with the people representing the culture that I'm providing tools for. So uh, even the people that have the knowledge are in dire need of, you know, uh, having communication uh, means to like talk to other people. So in that respect, I think networking is really important. And one, one other thing that's slightly off topic from this, but goes back to something that's already been mentioned. So we were talking about independence from algorithms. And I would just want to uh, add to that. So, you know, why, while it's somewhat easier for a person with tech background to like program your own environment or whatever, 
in this day and age, you're always going to bump into challenges with respect to your independence in any kind of software, really, especially with the new upcoming, you know, VR technology and all that stuff. It's all controlled by pretty big corporations. And I am personally having pretty big issues with that as well. Since, you know, if you own an Oculus headset, you have to register with Facebook in order to operate it. If you want to integrate it into your application, you're most likely going to use proprietary software to do that too. And if you want to roll it out, you know, you got to through a, uh, got to go through a curation process to get it store approved and all that kind of stuff. So I'm uh, thinking that generally speaking, we would be in a dire need to have a structural shift regarding that. So decentralization can, can only function if we can actually own the technology we develop. Um, and I think that we need to somehow crowdsource our ideas and make them avail available while maintaining their ownership. And one thing to really keep in mind with respect to metaverse, which is what also got mentioned is, you know, that term alone is somewhat of a marketing term established by Facebook, right? There's no such thing as like an, a, a, you know, an objective idea of the metaverse. You know, if you think of that in terms of like VR uh, research, it's more like a comprehensive environment for interconnected virtual reality applications. You know, I guess that would be like the objective way to put it, but we should be really um, considerate of like all the tools that we're using for streaming and, and doing stuff and finding ways to somehow maintain ownership over the pipeline that drives the culture that we're producing so that we can really, you know, maintain ownership of all that. Thank you. I can't agree more, but <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic what you said, but it's true that uh, I need to be realistic as much as I think you need to be realistic. And, you know, the cultural sector can't push the tech sector to be independent as much as there are issues that affect the cultural sector that are, you know, they are not linked to the tech ownership. But there are a lot of issues that are linked to the use of tech. So, you know, there's two levels. As you said, there is the level in which uh, I'm a tech developer and I realize that everything I need and supply comes only from one place, which is the US only or something around the US. Uh, they're not even in the US tax wise, but they are from the US. And then you, you realize that most of the tech development in the last few years during COVID has been pushed for free out there in order to hook people, make them develop all these things. I mean, nothing like Metaverse will have happened so fast without COVID happening. So that's one thing. So they kind of using all these terms and accelerating that universe because people actually jumped into the digital world so fast and they needed stuff and they needed, you know, to be digitally aware and to be digitally present. But I think as, as much as you and you do, that as I always teach, is like people that have money get it first because they have money and resources and they can do everything. What it comes is that this is not a value thing. This is like, I have the money, I make it happen. It doesn't mean in the cultural world that it's valuable. I mean, you know, lots of fashion people are doing a lot of incredible things for a lot of money, but it's not valuable for me in terms of culture. So I think the, the way that culture can push for a change in the ownership of tech is actually make them think that they're not using the right agents in the cultural sector. In the, in the, in the artist itself, like Patreon, you know, all these organizations that are trying to set up help for the, for the artist and the culture to kind of make money out of the digital, they're also owned by the US. So maybe this is even a frame in which we are closer in terms of cultural sector. It's like, we can't rely only on, you know, SoundCloud, Bands in Town, Patreon, and all this, uh, all this platform to make money and make it. And then it becomes you, a discussion with you as an independent tech creator saying, okay, do you think you can get in touch with suppliers that are actually giving you the uh, instruments or to develop other forms of virtual reality or VR or AR? that are not depending to those countries. Yeah. But as far as we know that we are in, you know, the problem with the online, and I will go further away, is that how dependent we are from the electrical sector, 
how dependent we are from the, you know, the digital computer sector. So, you know, there is a dependency that is clearly a tendency in the macro system. So this is something we can't really aim practically to change. Mm -hmm. But we definitely, from the cultural sector, we can change who we work with in tech and how we work with tech, yeah. uh, which is like, you know, it's a different way to, to flow. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess um, your, your point is exactly right. You know, you can always kind of choose the tools that you use to get a certain idea done. Um, and, and, you know, shifting over to the tools that are more independent is obviously a good path to take. Um, but what I was saying is, um, I believe that we're now witnessing a structural shift where these opportunities are just uh, decreasing and, um, you know, kind of the, the, um, the medium itself is just very small. You know, if, yeah. if we're thinking of Oculus, for instance, right, like this is the yeah. platform that if people want to access virtual reality technology, that's most likely the devices that they're going to use on a hardware level. And um, outside of that uh, domain, it's just difficult to even reach people. I mean, the whole society surrounding that is still like not uh, entirely integrating these technologies fully because they're, as you said, just available for a select few that have the means to afford them and all that. And while they're getting cheaper, it's it's also something where we, we have a shift in mentality where like a corporation is like, well, if you want to operate our hardware and we're not talking about their services, if you want to like shift on the headset and you want to use it, you have to have a certain login credential. So and, and, and that's that's essentially what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm not sure what we could do about that. I just think it's important that we address these means because there might be policies involved that we could have in place to to uh, lead to a shift because it, it yeah. doesn't end at software. Thanks. Basti for that input. Um, actually, Nasti wanted to say something before you, uh, but that's over. Then Franz uh, has also some input to give here in first row. No, I just wanted to say it's okay that you started. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, to answer the question. Yeah, I'm the editor of an independent blog and online magazine about electronic music, so I know your festival quite well. And we're independent from adverts and advertorials. So we yeah, finance ourselves with like nothing, <laughs> but with the skills of our authors and podcasters. And for one event, we got funding. But what I realized with that experience was that we were in need of more people, but had yeah, less money. And um, one person had to fulfill or had to maintain too many positions. And this is so exhausting. And when you look into the subculture and doing a festival and stuff, people are so exhausted. They can't really enjoy their success. They enjoy it, but yeah, you get so wasted with even if you have a funding. So this was uh, my experience. And in the end, I had to do the uh, finances <laughs> and um, all the writing for, yeah, for this institution. And what I see when I see, uh, do other projects in different spheres of the uh, cultural sector is that you can really concentrate on your position when you are out of subculture. There you have like, when you're working at a museum, you have your one job and you can really focus on that. And the question from Simon, um, what we need, for example, on our blog, we know a lot of designers that are yeah, eager and happy to design stuff for us, but they can't program this for us because it's too yeah, time consuming. And of course, we have to understand that. So we need to raise money all the time to get stuff programmed and not designed. So um, if I can, uh, you know, I don't work at Sonar anymore. It's been a year now, but uh, I'm a freelance, so I know what is about, and always been, even when I work at Sonar, to work in uh, different hats. Uh, though I'm hyperactive, so I can I can take it almost all the time, not all the time, though. But um, I mean, there's there's assets of optimizing by uh, by outsourcing the coding programming because, for instance. Uh, I'm right now in touch with a lot of, uh, because of my 
different interests that I have. I'm in touch with a lot of tech people on a very independent level, like very independent. And um, and for instance, here in Barcelona, they've created like a coding school for LGBTQ plus communities, um, which is uh, the, the the person who kickstart that is right close to me. And you know, all the girls that are coming in and out from this women in tech uh, or LGBTQ plus in tech. So one of the suggestions on one way is first of all to uh, this, all these inputs are very interesting in order to, again, in, in some way we go back to intersectionality and the fact that the more we are, the merrier we will be, is the fact that you get in touch with, um, you can get in touch through networks via, uh, via your people that know, or even us, because of course I'm talking on my experience, but we, we said this fundamentally. But that is that, you know, there are realities in which everybody wants to grow within that. And, you know, it's true that it's easier to find a designer than a coder because now everybody's coding and they're kind of getting crazy and they have jobs and it's good and they make money since they leave the, the you know, the, the courses and teaching. But it's also true that there's a lot of uh, community spirit within people that are actually coming out of the coding UX uh, atmosphere. I myself am working on um, my, my own website with no money, with a friend of mine that is a coder, all women, blah, 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 because, because it's, my, it's my network, like natural work, network. So it's not, it, it can't only based on non-money exchanges, <clears throat> of course, because I don't believe in that. We, we're still very much economically conscious and centered. But um, the, the plan is a bit like the startup philosophy, and it means applying the startup philosophy to the independent sector, because anyway, the startup, the beginning of a startup is very independent anyway. And so you just realize that you might go hand in hand with people that are actually studying something, and they need uh, a blog like yours, for instance. You know? yeah. One of the things that you know is that most of the festivals that could pick up from women promoter, LGBTQ plus promoter, they don't have the facility to have a blog, so you can actually offer the blog in order to support that lack of, of you know, writing skills that they have. Meanwhile, they organize, you know, we need more women in, in festivals, promoters, we need more LGBTQ plus uh, communities getting in there, and they struggle as much as they, you do on a different level, but I think it's completely natural with what you do in terms of complementary uh, necessity. So it's actually one of the good things that a network like Reset can offer is to complement uh, necessities and discussion uh, in order to be able to accept which are, for instance, the roles that are more needed, the discussions that are more in, into place. But it's true that in the workforce scenario, it's a big, big, big issue right now. But, you know, as much as it's a big issue for you, it's a big issue for events, for instance, and the events you like. You know, it can be in a clubbing scenario, it can be on... So you actually... Georgia, I don't like to interrupt, but uh, we have to wrap up pretty soon and there are some more okay. questions. It's such an interesting <laughs> question. So, yeah, and we can be in touch later. <laughs> yes, I think so. So there was another question by Franz in the, in the, fr in the first row and another one from Achim, and I think then... Our time is already over, uh, but yeah, so Franz. Hi, yeah. Sorry. Uh, not exactly a question, just a quick comment on that um, relationship between um, the culture sector and the tech sector. I, I work as a software developer myself, and um, I think there is uh, quite a few people, both in tech and in culture, interested in, in reducing the dependence on these big tech platforms that are currently the main means of, of publication for, for artists and, and culture also. And I think um, it's quite important for something like the, the Resist projects or what we are doing here in these days um, is to kind of maybe create something like a roadmap also for um, tech people or, or projects working in with these tools, what is actually to work on what is actually needed in the cultural sector. Because for especially all these smaller cultural projects, it's just too much of a task to kind of set up all the infrastructure needed for publication yourself. 
at the same time, many people coming out of technology um, are working on different kinds of tools that are often quite a bit detached from actual users. And kind of bridging that gap is, I think, not only like a financial point, but also an organizational one to actually talk to users and find out what is needed in, in those fields. Because money, in some ways, is quite available in the technology sector. There is a lot of quite a lot of public funding already available and that will likely get more in the next years. There's on the EU level there's there's several pushes for more money for it's often also framed in this we need independent European infrastructure. We have to reduce the dependency on American big tech. Has some questionable points in it also, but there is this this push currently. There is also quite a push for more open source software within the public sector. And I think um, voicing the demands of the independent cultural sector within that debate is something that is still missing or still not focused enough. I'm, I'm part of an initiative called the Shared Digital European Public Sphere. It's steps.eu, um, which collects a few initiatives around that goal to create like yeah, a public sphere of of independent publications and and to push for tools in, in that in that sector and i think um focusing or also doing maybe the research or, or pushing for the research needed to to actually know what kind of tools would be needed for independent publications and for a network of independent publications um is something that could be quite helpful because that would also or likely will inspire people coming out of the technical sector to kind of focus on projects that will actually find usage and not like happen in the in the uh, like technical nowhere land where you just work on tools you like um and yeah i think there is quite some room for for interesting projects in that kind of interconnection between the cultural and the tech tech sector um, i mean for yeah. me it's more than quite some room is is a room that we need yeah in terms of you know but that can happen only if the product developer and software developers, which for me is one of the key things to discuss with, it's uh, are already uh, represented by some kind of organization. Because of course, like individually speaking, it's very difficult and very like a very tough work to put together individuals with individuals. I mean, I think the good uh, one of the good things we can work out is to actually put together organizations with organizations, network with networks, because, you know, my experience right now that I'm involved with uh, some startups is that product developers are working on their stuff and they're developing that project and uh, normally losing money on time, but it's because they believe in it and it's all based, you know, on a future, future success. But it's true that that kind of aspirational moment can be applied as a formula but at the same time, with the restrict uh, values of working within the uh, scope of finding local outsourcing, uh, local, national, European outsourcing uh, tech suppliers that actually can organize this in a better way. But of course, this goes hand in hand, but it doesn't really need to come from the cultural organization. It needs to come from both, in meaning <clears throat> that they both agree on walking the same line on that goal which is, you know, the cultural organization needs the tech organization in order to produce a new world in which we can use each other for the same goals within uh, that kind of frame, ethical, uh, local, national, and uh, self-made in a way, because, you know, in lots of ways you, you need to build new technology. Yeah. Uh, there was a question from the chat. Um, you should please uh, announce the URL, oh. URL again because it was probably... It's with a D, S-D-E-P-S dot E-U. Okay, and then the last question by... Is it a question or a remark from, from Achim in the back? Oh yeah, it's a statement actually. <laughs> So isn't it always a problem that um, financial support is uh, only directed towards um, costs that are not uh, staffed? So you can't pay the staff, but you can pay equipment or, or you can have other items. Um, 
but there is no institutional funding um, because there are uh, there's personnel missing and to to actually put the projects in, in motion. But I think we already talked about this. So, Achim. Um, yeah, uh, I, th I think maybe I'm not that uh, fluent and fast in understanding and talking uh, English. That's why I didn't really get everything we talked about, but uh, um, something. And um, like, uh, as I understood, your European project where 16 countries are involved. And um, as like we're talking about like um, free media and like networking and the society do dimension today, I want to um, shift the topic like to um, political terms, which will be another day, a full day. But um, as we're talking now, I want to ask you directly, um, do you have, um, are you connected to like free uh, associations in Ukraine or in Russia? Which are not at the yet. moment fine. Not yet. Okay. We are not. I, I actually specifically reviewed the countries that we had uh, this morning because of that. Uh, uh, but the team is connected now on the website. The team in Lyon is connected on the website, your website, and any Slack with me. And um, yeah, we, we don't have any connection in, in Ukraine. If not, I will actually be starting with that as you can imagine it's priority for all of us to kind of uh, uh, set that, that that huge issue but no we don't have uh, a an Ukrainian liaison yet yeah so. it's, it's because I think like this is like the one one of the yeah biggest things that we need to be aware of that free uh, media and so on is like not everywhere um, a point and like every especially like in uh, dictatorships or where there's a suppressed media. Um, we um, should co try to connect to the people who are acti activists there and um, try to find a way to support each other uh, in a way. I mean, uh, this concretely, as you know, this happens as we speak. So uh, the thing is that uh, right now Reset has uh, already kind of reached the goal and it's just starting in February right now. So but already reached a goal in order to um, localize and identify the partners uh, of the first phase, which is the one I told you, 34 uh, members and counting. But, you know, one of the things that we actually put in together right now, it's um, the idea that we had on, on the last uh, streaming session that we had together in, in Lyon was to kind of create our word map and actually identify where are the missing points or which are the missing cities, which are the missing countries, in order to actually evaluate that everything the members will see is the map that they want to see because that's also very important. I mean, uh, there is a war in Ukraine, but there is also other issues in other countries that are close to censorship. Uh, despite the emergency, the huge emergency in Ukraine, you know that independent factors and independent sectors have these problems, maybe not that out there right now with violence, but it's a, it's a silent violence. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we can't forget those people uh, that are also not so visible in the media right now, but they are definitely there. And probably they have been through uh, those problems longer. One of the countries that we have that I think is very important to highlight is Georgia. And uh, as you know, uh, this to have Georgia in the in the list, it's, it's a very important factor uh, also. And it can actually highlight one of the, the examples that I'm using right now because, uh, you know, we don't necessarily need to go east all the time, but it's definitely uh, the examples that we can have. Yeah, but uh, even if we stay within the even if we stay within the EU, uh, there are lots of troubles. For instance, in our neighboring Poland or Hungary, in Hungary there's a free yes. radio, a uh, free uh, community radio, Tilos Radio, for instance, that is struggling. That was pushed into the internet, for instance, that after having a FM license for a very long time. So, I guess there will be a lot of uh, points that we can talk about where support is actually needed, especially when it comes to free speech and uh, 
inform, uh, freedom of information. But and with all due respect to, to Ukraine, you know, because we know that the Ukraine situation is priority in our hearts and definitely changing the agenda of priorities. But it's true that we have, and I thank you for that, because we have Hungary, we have Poland, we have Serbia, we have Georgia. So, you know, it, without thinking that maybe even in the most common, uh, like most that we think um, countries where they shouldn't have those kind of problems, that might have underlying situations that are actually kicking the independence out of the radar. radar. And this is something that is definitely in our uh, efforts and in our manifesto. Thank you very much, Georgia. I think it is time for us to wrap it up. Uh, it was lovely talking to you and I suppose um, somehow we will all get your contact and uh, keep in the discussion going then on a more individual basis or with the individual networks that are present here today. Thank you, Sharon. Bitte schön. Uh, I thought it was a really uh, amazing conversation. I wish I could be there to have, you know, lunch with you, dinner with you, have a bit of a talk with you, but, you know, very soon, hopefully. And uh, thank you very much for letting us present Reset, and we hope we'll be together working in the future, collaborating at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. <lacht> Anna. Ich glaube, jetzt können wir auf Deutsch wechseln. <lacht> ja. Ja, brauchen wir dafür auch das Mikrofon, dass wir dich alle gut hören und dass es aufgezeichnet wird? Ja. Machen wir das? Okay, Juhu. dann höre ich dich auch besser. Danke. Und zwar, ob und wie es möglich wäre, quasi unabhängige freie Radioarbeit zu machen, ohne die ganze Zeit nicht bezahlte organisations- und politische Arbeit zu machen. Und das ist da ja quasi im Moment bei den freien Radios <lacht> wohl und auch also bei also Kollektiven und Plattformen so das Problem gibt, es gibt Förderungen, und dann nur die Stellen, aber keine Leute. Und wenn man aber quasi die Leute auch bezahlt, gibt es ja quasi auch wieder sowas wie, dann ist man ja wieder abhängig. Und ob vielleicht Online-Radios oder Formate irgendwie sowas erschaffen könnten, wo man das lösen könnte, dieses Problem. Also ich glaube, ich habe die zwei Fragen so verstanden, mhm. weil da gab es auch noch die oben. Es ist, ich will, ich, also von meiner Perspektive her ist das einfach nur eine Verschiebung. Es ist halt ungefähr so wie zu behaupten, äh, Internet wäre halt ein total neues Medium. Es ist immer noch sprach- und, und äh, wortbasiert. Also von daher, ne, es ist elektrisch, aber es ist trotzdem so etwas ähnliches wie ein Buch, wenn man so will. Ich, ich weiß nicht, also das, vielleicht mag es sein, dass es dafür weniger Leute braucht, als wenn ich ein, ein Studio in, in einem... Haus oder sowas betreibe, aber am Ende ist es auch nicht unbedingt der Fall. Also du brauchst trotzdem eine Struktur sozusagen, wenn halt mal was nicht funktioniert oder wo lädst du es hoch und dann muss da jemand irgendwas pflegen und so weiter und so fort. Es ist nicht, also es gibt kein sich selbst, äh, es gibt keine Selbstfahrzeuge sozusagen, selbstfahrende Radiosendung oder sowas. Ähm, von daher, ja, es ist, das ist tatsächlich ein großes Problem, ja nicht nur bei den Radios, sondern auch bei anderen Institutionen, dass eben diese institutionelle Förderung halt komplett den Bach runtergegangen ist. Und ich glaube, das hat halt auch Covid gezeigt, dass das eben ein großes Problem ist. Also dass, dass es eben immer Projekt von Projekt zu Projekt geht und dass auch immer die Übergaben schwierig sind, wenn dazwischen zum Beispiel eine Lücke ist bei einem Projektträger, dass diese Wissensansammlungen, die stattgefunden haben, durch einzelne Projekte dann halt nicht fortgeführt werden können. Oder halt ein komplett neuer Antrag geschrieben wird über ein völlig anderes Konzept, was gar nicht anknüpfen kann oder vielleicht auch nicht muss und dann auch wieder neue Leute eingebracht werden, die halt die Strukturen von davor nicht kennen. Und das ist natürlich ein ganz großes Problem. Und eigentlich ist da auch, soll ich sagen, einfach durch die ähm, jahrzehntelange Erfahrung der freien Radios auch eine Möglichkeit, sich darüber mehr auszutauschen, weil wir auch bei uns, also das ist eine der Sachen, weswegen ich angefangen habe, mich auf einer administrativen Ebene auch zu interessieren und nicht nur meine Inhalte zu machen, weil ich gemerkt habe, dieser Wissenstransfer findet halt schwer statt. 
Ne? Also es gibt Leute, die haben halt bestimmte Fähigkeiten und, und, und Wissensstände, aber es gibt irgendwie keine Vergesellschaftlichung sozusagen von diesen Zugängen und von den Ansprechpersonen. In, in kleineren Regionen ist es teilweise sogar so, dass es dermaßen personell gebunden ist. Das heißt, wenn eine Persönlichkeit aus diesen Radius oder aus Vereinen oder was weiß ich was wegfällt, dann fällt eine gesamte Förderstruktur weg, weil das halt derjenige war, der buddy-buddy-mäßig mit den entsprechenden Politikern Bier trinken gegangen ist. Also das sind dann halt, ne, da gibt es dann teilweise krasse Einbrüche. Da gibt es einen Fall zum Beispiel in Österreich, was äh, halt eigentlich gar nicht so sein sollte, weil man sich denkt, naja, die hatten ja eine öffentliche Förderung, aber die war eben auch von so persönlichen Beziehungen abhängig. Und das ist zum Beispiel, finde ich, auch ein Thema, was wir in, in, in diesem Rahmen, in dieser Woche diskutieren können. Ne? Wie, wie wird Wissen weitergegeben? Ähm, wie, wie schaffen wir eine Speicherstruktur, die zugänglich ist, auch wenn sozusagen der interpersonelle Zugang fehlt? Aber ich dachte, wir machen jetzt zum Abschluss vielleicht eine Blitzlichtrunde. Also dass jeder noch mal so erzählt, was er oder sie heute mitgenommen hat. Ähm, und das hilft auch der Dokumentation und auch, dass wir wissen, was wir morgen sozusagen noch an offenen Fragen haben oder die sich dann eben auf den Freitag, auf dieses Wiki, was erstellt werden soll, kulminieren. Franz, du bist schließlich hier gerade, also du bist, achso, ich dachte, du bist gerade. Äh, ja, ich, also ich fand es jetzt interessant auf jeden Fall ähm, die, äh, zu sehen, was das jetzt schon für Netzwerk an, äh, also für Netzwerke gibt, die sich schon zusammengetan haben jetzt mit ähm, Reset und ähm, dem Bund Freier Radios kannte ich auch nicht, also ich bin so ganz uninformiert. <lacht> Aber äh, genau, ich hatte halt auch immer so die Idee, dass man halt sowas machen könnte, also keine Ahnung, ich dachte so über, über Fernsehen nach, ähm, weil ich, keine Ahnung, irgendwie nur ansonsten halt nur zwei Sender kenne noch, so aus, aus ähm, Budapest ähm, gibt es Free TV Europe, glaube ich, und ähm, aus ähm, New York 8-Ball TV. Ähm, und ja, weiß nicht so, aber genauso Radios oder ähm, ich weiß nicht so, es gibt da halt, ähm, weiß nicht so, also ich glaube, es, es könnte da halt noch eine ähm, bessere Übersicht geben oder eine Website, die quasi so, ein, so eine Übersicht zeigt, was gibt es eigentlich so wie äh, Radio.Garden zum Beispiel, ähm, was ich ein super äh, Projekt finde und ähm, ähm, da sind so alle Radio- ich weiß nicht, ob nee, nicht alle Radiosender sicherlich nicht, aber ich weiß nicht, 20.000 oder so, die man live hören kann auf dem Erdball, der sich so dreht, hoch. <lacht> äh, genau, und ähm, ich glaube, es ist wichtig, dass man irgendwie einen Überblick bekommt, ähm, wer macht eigentlich wo was gerade und ähm, wie schalte ich da rein ähm, und dass die Interfaces irgendwie so gestaltet werden, dass sie irgendwie zugänglich sind bei der Vielzahl von Informationen, die es gibt und die produziert werden. Und ich glaube, wenn ähm, freie Sender so erstmal gesehen werden und auf eine Weltkarte kommen oder auf eine Karte oder auch lokaler, dann ähm, findet Vernetzung auch automatisch mehr statt. So, ich glaube, es ist oft einfach die fehlende Information, dass man nicht weiß, ähm, welche Personen machen wo was. Anna, magst du vielleicht auch noch mal zusammenfassen, was, das, was der Chat so äh, gebracht hat heute? Also im Chat, ich habe ja gerade die Fragen von Kasper zusammengefasst. Genau. Das waren eigentlich die einzigsten, die es so richtig gab. Ansonsten gab es hauptsächlich Nachfragen zu Internetseiten, die genannt wurden. Ja. Weißt du, wie viele Leute sich beteiligt haben? Na, ich sehe hier, also es waren immer so bis zu zehn Leuten drin. Mehr oder weniger und viele, nicht so, ja, ich schätze mal, es haben so sieben Leute geschrieben. Eins, zwei, drei, acht verschiedene Namen sehe ich hier. Ja, schön. Aber ist doch, also, ich meine, frag mich, ob wir dann halt so verständlich waren, dass es so wenig Nachfragen gab oder, ja. Magst du weitermachen mit dem, dein, dein Blitzlicht, was dir heute so besonders aufgefallen ist oder was dich interessiert hat, was, was für dich äh, der Tag gebracht hat. Ich habe deinen, ich weiß deinen Namen von, von dem, ja. Ah, Hallo Darko. Hallo. Äh, ja, für mich war interessant zu, äh, zu hören, wie, äh, wie Leute denken und wie, äh, was sind die Probleme. 
Äh, und ähm, ja, ich, ich warte noch äh, nächste Tage mehr, mehr mich zu involvieren, äh, äh, weil ich bin, ich teile, äh, ich teile äh, meine Expertise mit, äh, nicht direkt mit Medien, aber mit, äh, mit Finanzierung und Organisierung. Und ich denke, dass wegen ich bin da. Äh, und äh, ja, ich, ich eigentlich, äh, ich, ich bin involviert mit äh, Recherchieren vom Lobbyismus. Uh, was ist eine sehr dunkle Seite uh, uh, in, in, in Europa? Uh, es ist ein sehr dunkler dunkel, uh, Lobbyismus. Lobbyismus, ja. Uh, durch uh, welche sind uh, Policies uh, um, beeinflusst? Und uh, die Medien, uh, die Medien ist immer ein uh, ein Teil in die Kette, das spielt, das spielt eine große Rolle und hat große Beinfluss. Und äh, eigentlich da ist absolut Bedarf äh, für, die, äh, für, die, äh, für die neue äh, Medien, das konnten äh, äh, Informationen, also zum Beispiel als Wikileaks, äh, das äh, mehr in Einfluss äh, kann bringen. Und von meiner Seite ist es äh, zum Beispiel, äh, man kommt zu finanzieren. Das, das ist, die, das ist die, äh, auch ein Teil, äh, ohne funktioniert nicht. Und eigentlich, äh, von, wenn, ich, wenn ich sehe jetzt äh, äh, die Projekte, das ist erfolgreich äh, finanziert oder nicht, da war die, auch, die Hauptgrund war immer, wie zum Beispiel ein Projekt beeinflusst äh, Leben von den Menschen. Äh, wann, kommt, äh, wann kommt die Frage äh, von der äh, Finanzierung von dem Unter? Von unter? Äh, und äh, das bringt eigentlich Unabhängigkeit. Äh. Ja, und so, äh, ich denke, ich hoffe, das wurde in den nächsten Tagen wurde mehr äh, Analyse, zum Beispiel, äh, was eigentlich bringt bring die Menschen zu unterstützen, äh, solche Projekte? Und was konnten, äh, was konnten, äh, äh, was konnten äh, beeinflussen die Menschen? Dass sie wurden interessieren, interessiert, äh, zu, äh, diese Projekte zu unterstützen. Also wie man aus seiner Filterblase rauskommt. Äh, ja. Mhm. ja. Dankeschön. Ja. Maxim, was? Was ist dir heute so im Gedächtnis geblieben oder was sind die Punkte, die dich angesprochen haben? Also vielleicht zu dem, bei dem ersten Input, da hatte ich so Gedanken, dass wir relativ viel über, Qualität, über Quantität gesprochen haben, über Reichweiten, das war auch ein wichtige, wichtiger Punkt, hast du erwähnt auf deinem Zettel. Ich glaube, dass die Reichweite, wie wir sie manchmal formulieren, gar nicht so... Ähm, also ich, ich vielleicht das auch anders verstehe, unsere Reichweite ist teilweise in unseren direkten Netzwerken, ich meine, wir reden hier über Streaming, über, über wie können wir sie halt maximal digital ver, vermehren, wie können wir irgendwie, weiß nicht, also vielleicht denken wir da so irgendwie in Reichweiten von irgendwelchen YouTube-Größen äh, und Millionen Klicks, aber ähm, teilweise finde ich es eigentlich sehr wichtig, in der Reichweite zu denken, in der wir heute irgendwie zusammenkommen, wo wir halt quasi in einem Raum uns zusammen finden können und auch, wenn ich das, was wir hier vorhaben, Leuten versucht habe zu beschreiben, dann habe ich immer so vom Bubble-Sharing gesprochen, weil wir halt auch sehr, sehr verschiedene Bubbles hier bedienen, also auch wie wir hier sitzen und die Leute, die auch noch in dieser Woche teilnehmen werden. Ich bin halt ein bisschen überreizt gerade mit, vielen, mit Informationen, weshalb ich relativ schwer alles zusammenfassen kann, aber ich vor allem aus einem eigener Arbeit es sehr schätze, eben die qualitative Reichweite zu äh, erbringen also, oder zu erforschen oder auch in dieser, in dieser Bubble quasi die zu erweitern, mit Leuten in, in Interaktion zu treten ähm, und ähm, teilweise wirklich halt ähm, die Möglichkeiten, die wir haben, also vom Sphere, vom Hitness, ähm, meinen eigenen Wertkollektivarbeit oder anderen Bubbles, die halt quasi hier vorhanden sind, ähm, da eigentlich eher so weiterzudenken. Also ich bin jetzt gespannt, was da noch die Woche so bringt, so wo man halt quasi an welchen Punkten man sich irgendwie noch irgendwie so anpingt. 
Ähm, genau, und vor allem quasi eigentlich gar nicht so jetzt äh, mir den Stress machen möchte, irgendwie über diese Quantität quasi mir Gedanken zu machen, sondern ich denke mir, dass es halt irgendwie bis jetzt eigentlich auch ganz gut war, die, diese Qualität halt eben halt in den, also genau, in den direkten ähm, Kontakt zu haben und jetzt noch natürlich auch ein bisschen auch außer, also wir, wir testen gerade eigentlich aus, wie weit können wir kommen eigentlich mit den Gedanken, die wir irgendwie hier produzieren und ich bin eigentlich, ähm, ja, sehr, sehr überrascht, dass wir halt quasi im Chat weiter oder halt irgendwie auch weiter mit digitale Medien uns irgendwie auch jetzt weiter austauschen. Genau. Daniel? Oder? Nee, was? Ich dachte, du heißt Daniel. Nee, nee. Ich, ja. Daniel, du hast Freunde. Ah, oder? <lacht> Sagst du noch, ich habe deinen Namen dann eben nicht gehört. Ja, ich bin Micha. Hallo, wie Micha. War, wie war dein Name nochmal? Maxim. Ich glaube, Maxim hat gerade so die halbe Antwort auf die Frage gegeben, die ich so mitgenommen habe. Ähm, ich habe mir, glaube ich, gerade die Frage gestellt, in, ähm, im, äh, vor dem Kontext, dass man halt versucht, also, Medien, also Plattformen zu schaffen, die sowas wie eine äh, unabhängige Gegenöffentlichkeit zu den uns bekannten großen äh, Streaming-Plattformen oder ähm, das Thema, was wir quasi vor, vor einer halben Stunde irgendwie mal angerissen hatten, also wo du auch viel zu gesagt hast, ähm, dass ich das immer noch als, als Mammutaufgabe äh, ansehe, weil wir da einfach einen sehr, sehr professionellen Gegenspieler haben, wo ich nicht sehe, wie wir da mit unserer Zeit und mit einem demokratischen Prozess, der alles noch mal viel, viel länger dauern lässt, also der vielleicht der notwendig ist, aber der trotzdem alles länger dauern lässt sozusagen. Und gleichzeitig ähm, der Erfahrung der NutzerInnen, die sozusagen immer auf diesem Stand sind, den die große Industrie vorgibt. Also das ist sozusagen immer der Standard, der gesetzt wird als, als Erfahrung von Technik oder äh, Nutzung von Technik sozusagen. Und ich sehe das als äh, ja gerade noch von meinem Standpunkt als relativ unlösbare Aufgabe da ähm, so auf einer ähm, ehrenamtlichen, zivilgesellschaftlichen Ebene irgendwie mitzuhalten und mitzukommen. Aber vielleicht ist die halbe Lösung oder die halbe Antwort auf die Frage eben nicht, nach, nicht auf Quantität zu achten, sondern auf Qualität. Und ähm, da halt sich, sich die, die Ziele nicht so hoch zu stecken, sondern eben zu gucken, wen kann ich äh, realistisch erreichen und was kann ich in dem Bereich irgendwie machen. Und, Genau, aber die andere Frage bleibt trotzdem auch noch in meinem Kopf. Dankeschön. Telemut Hunter, Tom und Clara, oder ich sehe gar nicht, ob, von hier aus sehe ich immer nicht, ob Clara noch da ist. Hallo. Ihr habt euch ja vorhin ja als Kinder am, am Erwachsenentisch, fand ich ja gar nicht, euren Einsatz fand ich ja gar nicht so, wie soll ich sagen, naiv oder sowas, sondern absolut wertvoll. Wie ist es euch denn hier heute ergangen? Was ist euch im Gedächtnis geblieben? Was sind eure Fragen, die ihr mitnehmt? Ja, also ich glaube auch dieser zentrale Punkt mit wie, also wie können wir eigentlich, oder was bei uns ganz oft auch aufgetreten ist, ist einfach wie, wie kann man vermeiden, immer wieder bei YouTube zu landen zum Beispiel. Ne? Also selbst wenn man irgendwo was einbettet, nutzt man am Ende immer alles, was es schon gibt. Ähm, und genau das fand ich jetzt super spannend. Das macht sich wahrscheinlich auch nochmal in den nächsten Tagen ein bisschen weiter auf, dass ähm, so technische Fragen da auch zu klären. Und da habe ich gerade auch den Gedanken gehabt, einerseits wegen dieser Quantität und Qualität. Ich glaube, so meistgeklickte Videos, äh, also ein Hund auf zwei Beinen im Froschkostüm, wird sehr oft angeklickt. Das macht es aber nicht relevant. Also ist auch süß. Aber ich habe halt irgendwie das Gefühl, dass wir auch ähm, das als Superpower verstehen können, dass wir eigentlich nicht darauf einfach nur darauf achten müssen, dass es möglichst viele sehen, sondern eben auch eine Nachhaltigkeit zu entwickeln und es vielleicht eine Schnittmenge gibt zwischen Quantität und Qualität, die dann am Ende eine nachhaltigere und größere Wirkung hat, als jetzt die größte Klickzahl und die meiste Reichweite, die höchste Reichweite zu haben. Und das andere, was ähm, mir vorhin auch noch äh, in der ersten, ich glaube, Franz hatte das gesagt, ähm, wollte ich auch noch so etwas Ähnliches sagen wie so eine Art, nee, Adam war es, so eine Art Map, irgendwie vielleicht zu kreieren oder was ich spannend finden würde, wäre halt so eine Art TV-Programm weitergedacht, ähm, eine, Para eine Parallelkarte, wo festgehalten wird, wer wann was wo macht, ähm, was es zum Beispiel gerade für Förderstrukturen gibt, dass man es das irgendwie thematisch aufbereitet, dass man sagt, wer beschäftigt sich gerade mit welchen Themen, ähm, was gibt es schon für Wissensstrukturen und da irgendwie so eine, es ist ein Riesenaufwand, ich weiß nicht, ob es überhaupt möglich ist, aber irgendwie schon so eine, wie eine Landkarte hat, wo irgendwie verschiedene Sachen 
festgehalten werden. Das fände ich auch total, eine total schöne Utopie, irgendwie sowas zusammenzufassen. Natürlich nicht von allem auf der Welt, aber vielleicht irgendwie stetig wachsend, sich da irgendwie zusammenzutun. Und das allein schon, dass diese Utopien im Raum steht, also finde ich einfach sehr schön, die nächsten Tage weiter zu denken. Genau. Auch so, auch so im Anschluss an das, was du eigentlich vorhin gesagt hast, dass es recht schnell geht oder man eigentlich damit anfängt, sich so alleine auf weiter Flur zu fühlen. Weil jetzt, wenn wir schon beim WWW sind, das irgendwie so ein äh, schier unüberblickbarer, nicht haptischer Space ist sozusagen. Und eigentlich, ja man dann in solchen Momenten wie jetzt merkt, dass es eigentlich schon in einer Stadt sozusagen irgendwie viele Leute gibt, die äh, vielleicht ähnliche Fragen bewegen oder bereit wären zu kooperieren, ähnliche Probleme haben, vor ähnlichen Herausforderungen stehen und dass man eigentlich gar nicht alleine sozusagen an dieser einen Sache arbeiten muss. Und eben deswegen im Anschluss zu dem, was du meintest, zu dieser, oder was du gerade aufgegriffen hast mit der Karte, dass es eigentlich vor allen Dingen mir zumindest der Überblick fehlt oder ein Weg äh, miteinander zu connecten sozusagen und irgendwie so auch eben im Sinne der Nachhaltigkeit vielleicht Verbindungen herzustellen und einen Überblick zu bekommen darüber, wer was macht und mit wem man worüber sprechen kann, sozusagen, um nicht zu monologisieren. Danke. Sebastian, Basti? Jo. Also ich kann mich auf jeden Fall schon mal Maxim anschließen. Ich bin auch gerade ganz schön überladen mit allem, was heute so passiert ist, aber auf eine sehr, sehr positive Art. Ich bin mit relativ diffusen Erwartungen, glaube ich, in, in diese Woche gestartet und vieles davon hat sich sehr positiv ausgelöst, äh, aufgelöst. Ich finde, es ist äh, direkt ziemlich wertvoll wahrzunehmen, wo so die einzelnen Perspektiven herkommen, was sind auch so die Historien hinter dem freien Radio und so, um wirklich mal Kontext in meinen sonst eigentlich sehr tech-basierten Alltag zu kriegen. Das finde ich immer cool, weil äh, dagegen wird sich, wehrt sich diese Struktur, Technologie, auch oftmals, weil die Herausforderungen sind groß und so, man löst viel Probleme und so. Und äh, genau, ja, ich finde es halt cool, da einfach auch Gesichter dahinter zu haben. Und deswegen bin ich auch voll dabei zu sagen, hier passieren qualitative Dinge. Und jedes große Problem, was heute irgendwie aufgetan wurde, kann man vielleicht mit informatischen Informatikmitteln irgendwie dividen und konkern oder so. Vielleicht auch nicht so, aber der Austausch war total cool und inspirierend. Und ich freue mich auf jeden Fall auch auf die nächsten Tage. <lacht> Danke. Nasti. Ja, ich schließe mich allen an, die jetzt schon das so toll zusammengefasst haben. Und ich bin einfach sehr dankbar, dass ich hier teilnehmen durfte. Und es war ein toller Workshop-Tag. Dankeschön. <lacht> Danke dir für die Einbringung. Sabine, du als äh, erste Panel-Speakerin, oder nee, ist ja nicht, ist ein Impulsvortrag. <lacht> Was hast denn du mitgenommen? Ah, ich bin, glaube ich, auch ein bisschen überladen. Äh, ganz wichtig fand ich das, was der Franz vorher gesagt hat, dass nämlich die Anwender und die Programmierer zusammenkommen müssen und dass, äh, dass da ein, ein enger Austausch stattfinden muss. Und ich äh, finde es äh, gerade ein bisschen erschreckend, dass das von mir so rüberkam, wenn es bloß um Reichweite geht. Äh, das war so ein bisschen auch die Frage der Kuratierung, ähm, weil man ja eben klar äh, mit, mit Dingen, die man anspruchsvoller macht, eben nicht so weit kommt und die Idee, also äh, ich verstehe mich halt als, ähm, als einer, der, der im Vorstand oder in, in einem administrativen Teil von dem Verband sitzt, jemand, der dafür sorgt, dass die Inhalte weiterkommen. Aber äh, ich sehe auch zunehmend, dass halt die Leute mehr mit solchen administrativen Arbeiten beschäftigt sind. Ich selber auch. Und überhaupt nicht mehr zu den eigentlichen Dingen, die man mal machen wollte, zu kommen. Und das äh, bringt mich dann wieder zurück, darüber nachzudenken, wie kann ich denn eigentlich das machen, worauf ich Lust habe. Ich habe vorhin nur gemeint, dass äh, im Rahmen von, als, als, nachdem du gesprochen hast, dass der äh, wurde gedroppt, weißt du? Mhm. Ja, ich habe es aufgenommen tatsächlich mit dieser Reichweite, weil es mir als Arbeitsfrage vorgelegt genau, worden ist. Genau, ich meinte nicht deinen dein Beitrag, sondern ich meinte nur, dass du das quasi in der ersten Hälfte dass es gefallen ist. Also ich wollte dich nicht adressieren. Ja. Okay. Aber es ist tatsächlich ein Thema in dem Sinne nicht nur, also es ist, nicht, es ist kein Eigeninteresse, sondern es ist halt teilweise auch aufoktoriert. Also was, dass man halt für bestimmte... Förderanträge und so weiter und so fort immer wieder dieses Thema hat. Und deswegen ist es für uns halt auch interessant, ob das für euch das auch hat oder kann man sozusagen Common Ground finden und sagt irgendwie, nein, 
Wir wehren uns dagegen. Das ist genau das, was wir nicht wollen. Wir wollen nicht diese neoliberalistische Auswer also Verwertungslogik. Ne? So, also Reichweite ist für uns kein Kriterium. Also in dem Sinne, ja, ne, bei FM ist es halt oder UKW ist es ein Kriterium in dem Sinne, wie viele Leute kann ich potenziell erreichen, weil sie ein Gerät haben und sie könnten es empfangen. Aber es ist immer noch deren eigene Entscheidung, ob sie das Radio einschalten oder nicht oder eben Internet. Aber das ist, ne, so, das, das ist eigentlich, glaube ich, unser Stand, wo wir uns darauf einigen können. Aber ich finde es halt eben interessant zu wissen, jetzt so äh, auch unterhalb, innerhalb von Digital Natives oder neuen Kollektiven, wenn ich, wenn ich euch zuhöre, dass es eben auch darum geht, tatsächlich irgendwie für sich selber Qualitätsmaßstäbe zu setzen, die nicht von Likes und Herzchen und Sternchen und ich weiß nicht was irgendwie diktiert sind, sondern die anderen Logiken folgen. Gut, das ist jetzt nochmal mein Einwand für heute und dann haben wir noch den Franz nicht gehört. Und ich würde auch gerne mal hören, was Sie, ihr, ihr fleißigen Bienchen, die hier so im Raum rumschwebt und uns hörbar und sehbar macht, was, was bei euch so angekommen ist. Ähm, ja, ich kann mich auch vielem anschließen, was schon gesagt wurde. Es war auf jeden Fall viel äh, Inhalt heute schon da. Ähm, was mir jetzt zum, zuletzt gerade auch mit dieser Reichweitenfrage, die nochmal aufkam, so im Kopf rumschwirrt, ist, schon, dass es so eine Veränderung gibt. Ne? Die freien Radios, wo wir es viel gehört haben, sind so entstanden. Wir schaffen uns ein Mittel, um irgendwie Öffentlichkeit herzustellen oder überhaupt irgendwie Minoritäten, äh, Meinungen oder, oder äh, Produktionen zu verbreiten. Und das, die Situation ist ja heute nicht mehr da. Jede, jeder hier kann online veröffentlichen, ohne irgendwie viel dafür tun zu müssen. Da reicht es sich, vor einen Laptop zu stellen und in die Kamera zu sprechen und das Ganze auf YouTube zu publizieren. Weshalb sich so ein bisschen auch, glaube ich, so die die Fragestellung von dem, was wir hier oder so anstreben oder so, man nochmal vielleicht ein bisschen besuchen muss, ähm, also es viel schon öfter jetzt kuratieren zum Beispiel, das ist was, was auf diesen Plattformen nur deutlich schwerer möglich ist, weil da die Kuratierung nochmal von der Plattform ähm, vorgenommen wird. Also ich glaube so, ähm, es geht nicht nur um die Möglichkeit, Inhalte zu veröffentlichen, sondern um die Form da drumherum und das irgendwie nochmal mehr zu fokussieren, was da eigentlich das ist, was irgendwie hier ein gemeinsames Interesse vielleicht darstellt, das vielleicht ein anderes Interesse ist als ähm, das von Twitch oder von YouTube oder auch von ähm, den sogenannten InfluencerInnen oder sowas. Ähm, das ist, glaube ich, oft noch recht diffus so. Also für mich selber auch immer wieder, ob man dann, wenn man sagt, man will Qualität in den Vordergrund stellen, aber was ist dann der Qualitätsbegriff, wenn man zugleich ja irgendwie DIY und, und äh, allen ermöglichen, aber vielleicht doch nicht allen ermöglichen, und gegen Öffentlichkeit ist es nicht eigentlich das, was die äh, Rechten online gerade eher machen, als dass wir das machen. So. Also da ist, glaube ich, gibt es schon noch einige Fragestellungen, die auch für die nächsten Tage, kommt ja auch noch so der, der inhaltliche und politische Teil und so, die gar nicht so leicht zu beantworten sind, was denn das eigentlich ist, was man hier irgendwie als gemeinsames Interesse von Streaming und Plattformen und so schaffen will. Und da bin ich auf jeden Fall gespannt auf die Auseinandersetzung. Ähm, voll, also da kann ich jetzt noch anschließen, so dass, dass wir also heute immer noch bei der Gesellschaft in welchen Dimensionen sind und dann ähm, quasi wir vielleicht hier trotzdem so sehr, ähm, also aus einer, weiß nicht, vielleicht so ähm, Bubble sprechen, die halt wahrscheinlich eher so in der Großstadt wohnt und ähm, oder weiß ja nicht so, ich glaube jetzt nicht unbedingt äh, quasi die ganze Gesellschaft so abbildet und dass er vielleicht auch so der ähm, ein, eins der Ziele sein könnte, die ähm, also halt, halt man damit nutzen kann, mit den, ähm, also mit den Sendern, dass man halt noch mehr Verbindungen schafft und ähm, sich genau aussucht, was man zeigen möchte eigentlich. Äh, ja. Ich würde jetzt noch mal an euch die Frage geben, und zwar, weil ihr ja mitgeschnitten habt, fehlt euch noch irgendeine Information, die wir jetzt hier im Plenum an euch äh, kulminieren könnten? Also für mich konkret jetzt nicht. Ich denke, wir haben heute viele Themen auch aufgemacht, die wir hoffentlich in den nächsten Tagen noch mal vertiefen. Also gerade so dieses Finanzielle und Förderung und so weiter war ja mehrmals Thema, dass wir das am dritten Tag noch mal vertiefen können. Und sonst, glaube ich, war das aber ein guter Auftakt heute. Ich fand es vor allem spannend, die Perspektive auch von Leuten eher aus dem technischen Feld zu hören und da über so Kommunikationsschwierigkeiten vielleicht zu sprechen oder generell auch Wissenstransfer im Allgemeinen, der manchmal nicht so gut 
funktioniert, wie er sollte oder an Personen gebunden, zu stark an Personen gebunden ist. Ähm, und dass wir auch mal ganz grundsätzliche Fragen äh, diskutiert haben, was heißt eigentlich frei sein und unabhängig. Ähm, genau. Ähm, genau, also ich bin da noch nicht so lange bei vier und ich fand es irgendwie total spannend, was heute für Probleme besprochen wurden oder was eigentlich was es für Dimensionen gibt. Das war mir vorher alles noch nicht so bewusst. Und deswegen bin ich auch voll froh, dass ich heute da sein konnte. Und ähm, bin auch gespannt, was die nächsten Tage noch besprochen wird. Ja. Simon, Simon, als Gastgeber, magst du auch noch ein abschließendes Wort für uns äh, formulieren? Also ich nehme mal kurz meinen Computer zur Hand, äh, weil ich habe mich, ich habe gerade mich gefragt, weil ihr, äh, es ging ja gerade um dieses Quantitätsthema und dann habe ich mich gefragt, woher kommt das? Äh, weil du hast gemeint, es gibt äh, Leitfragen, ähm, wo das mit drin steht, aber dann habe ich gesehen, es steht gar nicht mit drin. <lacht> Nicht nee, aber also grundsätzlich, ich, ich bin total froh, was heute hier passiert ist. Also ich fand es auch so eigentlich genau das, worauf ich gehofft hatte, dass es hinausläuft. Also so ein sehr runder, vielseitiger Blick auf das Thema. Ähm, ich würde vielleicht zum Abschluss auch noch mal ähm, kurz vorlesen, was wir damals ähm, zusammengeschrieben haben als so einleitenden Text in unserem Exposé. Die, das habt ihr auch alle bekommen, vielleicht auch gelesen. Ähm, da habe ich mir dann gedacht, okay, ja, haben wir geschafft. <lacht> ähm, genau, also der, das Ganze lief ja unter dem Titel äh, oder unter der Dimension Gesellschaft. Das war der Fokus von heute für uns. Ähm, natürlich abstrakt gedacht und so, wie wir darauf irgendwie eingehen wollen. Ähm, beginnt mit einer Näherung an gesellschaftliche Strukturen, in denen Kultur eingebettet ist. Ein Überblick über Netzwerke, aus denen sie sich speist und in denen sie sich verbreiten kann. Damit möchten wir, auf das, möchten wir das Potenzial der digitalen Vermittlung für die diverse Neuverknüpfung oder Festigung bestehender Netzwerke innerhalb der Gesellschaft durch Kultur umreißen. Genau, also ich finde, wir haben das super gemacht. Und äh, auch äh, bin sehr froh, dass keine Person hier scheu war, auch ins Mikro zu sprechen, äh, weil gerade die ganz stillen äh, in dem Kulturbereich wir sind so wichtig zu hören und ich hoffe, wir können irgendwie hier den Raum geben, dass sie sich äußern können. Und genau, vielleicht auch immer mehr noch über die Menschen, die nicht vor Ort sein können, weil es so schön wäre, wenn wir mehr davon hier hätten, vielleicht beim nächsten Mal. Aber nutzt den Chat und äh, genau. Ja, hier ist auch nochmal der nette Hinweis, wenn ihr noch Fragen an die Speakerin habt, die euch jetzt im Nachhinein einfallen. Ich glaube, das gilt auch für das Auditorium hier. Es gibt eine Sphere-Internet, äh, eine Sphere-E-Mail-Adresse, dahin könnt ihr dann eure Fragen und Anmerkungen schreiben und dann landet das halt hier auch bei den SpeakerInnen und die werden sich dann mit euch in Verbindung setzen, denke ich. Also das ist auch noch eine Möglichkeit. Ja, dann herzlichen Dank für den ersten Tag und äh, mögen die nächsten auch so nett sein. <lacht>